हाई फ्रेंड्स दिस इज एग्नल और राजेश शेयर चेयरमैन फॉर सेंट एंजलोज वी एन सी वेंचर्स वी आर इंडिया लार्जेस्ट विला डेवलपर्स डेवलपिंग विलाज एट थाने चेन्नई मदुरै कोयम्बतूर एंड हैदराबाद एडवांटेज ऑफ बाइंग विलाज विथ अजिस वी गिव यू रेंटल रिटर्न आफ्टर यू बाय द विला एंड द मेंटेनेंस इज जीरो यू डोंट हैव टू पुट मनी नॉर एफर्ट्स टू मेंटेन द विला वी आर प्रोग्रेसिव रेंटल रिटर्न एंश्योर्स दैट आफ्टर यू बाय द विला ई एम आई और द लोन रीपेमेंट फॉर द विला इज ऑफसेट बाय द रेंटल रिटर्न दैट वी जनरेट फॉर मोर डिटेल्स विजिट इज ऑन डब्ल्यू 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 डॉट एस ए वी वी ग्लोबल डॉट कॉम एवरीबडी आइडलाइज अ रोनाल्डो और अ मेसी और अ माइकल जॉर्डन बट फाइनली दे आर वॉट दे आर बिकॉज क्राउड्स कम टू सी दम वी गॉट अ यंग पॉपुलेशन दे नीड प्लेस इज टू गो सो इफ इन वन प्लेस यू कैन डू सो मच मोर देन यू रियली गॉट अ ग्रेट प्लेस टू जनरेट फुटफॉल इन इंडिया वेन वी डिड दिस प्रोजेक्ट आर बी आई डिड नॉट इवन हैव अ section in the rbi guidelines saying sports infrastructures infrastructure infrastructure we got it done hi friends this is agnello rajesh here i'm chairman for saint angelo's vncd ventures and today we are at the 42nd episode of inspiring conversations today we have a very interesting guest with us a very young and a dynamic person from a very different sector and from a unique personality background in terms of business as well as the individual i would like to introduce you to mr udit seet hi udit Hi lovely to have you on board thank you for inviting me thanks to network 18 very exciting i've been seeing a few of the clips of what you you've been doing and inspiring and that's it's really nice to hear from so many different people so i hope i can do justice to your fantastic show i'm sure you've done a great deal of justice to the activity that you are involved with so friends udit is into the business of sports a healthy country is a wealthy country and what udit does is something which is very exciting and very interesting and has created a map for india in the whole global space in the field of sports arena friends he has built trans stadia which is one of the most unique kind of a stadium infrastructure that the world has ever seen it's at ahmedabad in gujarat and how he has done this journey and what he has achieved is something that we would like to know from udit so udit you have been a sports enthusiast yourself right and that's what motivated you to get into this business being a second generation entrepreneur you are the first generation entrepreneur in what you have been done right in the sports uh, facility so what prompted you to take this large leap because creating a stadium is a huge capital intensive activity so what motivated you to take this plunge well really you know nobody really realizes stadiums can be exciting you know you go globally and everybody likes to watch the match everybody idolizes a ronaldo or a messi or a michael jordan but finally they are what they are because crowds come to see them and to get crowds into a game or to get into a stadium is an art you you have to at the end of the day build something which is in the city it has Absolutely. a great architecture great ergonomics you know, the bums on the seats have to be comfortable there has to be sanitation there has to be great hospitality around it and really the way i see stadiums i don't look at them as stadiums i see them as city centers i see them as a hub of activity like a beehive you have retail you have entertainment you have hospitality you've got um sports science you've got academy so something or the other has to keep going on we look at a global average of stadiums which have a utilization of maybe 2% per annum we are targeting 72% per annum so that's the difference between how we build it with technology retractable seating convertible indoor outdoor parts of the stadium great parking you know in india we have a big demographic dividend it can become a uh, dynamite as well but i think uh, we've got a young population they need places to go our urban areas are so cramped for place so if in one place you can do so much more then you've really got a great place to generate footfall parents my age um, and younger both the people in the family are working so where do the kids go are they going to play playstation the whole day or are we going to get them into activities and experiential activities so that's what we do fantastic so a stadium which can seat 40000 people in the outdoors and can seat 4000 people in the indoors is a humongously large project it's sports infrastructure yes and you embarking on such a large project what kind of homework did you do before you embarked on this project it's a and how long did it take you for the homework so it's a 20000 seater stadium but nonetheless it's really large we've built 1.4 million square feet in about 31 months Fantastic. from the time we got the land to the time we got into commerce it was 31 months so we did a really quick job and we benchmarked the best stadiums globally we went to tokyo dome we went to the amsterdam arena we saw the o2 arena we saw staples center we said 
let's take the best and let's customize it for India. And then, of course, you've got to cut the cloth depending on the demographic that you are in. And that's what we did. So your passion for sports and your exposure to international technology and international arenas helped you to do the marriage between technology and real estate infrastructure together. That's right. I'm, uh, I'm not just a sports enthusiast. I've played sport at a very high level. I've enjoyed playing football, basketball. Um, I do a lot on fitness now. So I think um, for me, it was not just about getting a project up, it was to get it up with the right ergonomics, it's, it's with the right planning. I mean, not a square foot of space is wasted in this arena. And uh, when you build the stadium, I'm sure you must have had your balance sheet before you build the stadium yeah. on what can be your assets and what can be your liabilities. How did you study that? Did you study that on your own or did you have financial experts advising you on what can be the outcome of this bold investment? So, you know, I can't take credit for the stadium on my own. In fact, I have worked with the best, especially with my dad, who's a financial whiz. Um, we spent a lot of time. I was all but 28 at the time when I was conceptualizing this. And um, it was a first in India. And we wanted to make sure that it was done right. Um, we spent a lot of time. We must have made at least a dozen business plans, which we said, OK, can we do it? Can we not do this? Can we cut out this? Can we add this? The amount of area statements that I may have gone through is a whole plethora of them. And we must have gone through three professional outdoor agencies which have come and kind of done their own analysis, their own survey, their own feasibility studies. Then we had to make the project bankable. Imagine trying to make a stadium bankable. In India, when we did this project, RBI did not even have a section in the RBI guidelines saying sports infrastructures, infrastructure. Infrastructure. We got it done. You got the status done. I got that status done. So, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of learning which I got in the process, but there's a lot of number crunching and a lot of uh, iterations. I'm sure there must have been a lot of mistakes that would have happened along the way, but how fast could you identify a mistake and rectify it as an entrepreneur? So the advantage we had is because we did this project the first time, um, in India, government doesn't like to do things the first time. So it took a lot of time for the file to go through the cabinet and all of that. So we got a lot of time on our hands to review, to refine. But once we refined it and once we said go, we didn't change a thing. Because we're very clear that each time once you get into construction, and I think you do a lot of construction work. Yes. Then um, you... The it's cost, planning. The cost goes out of Absolutely. hand, you know, you change a wall. Your whole planning goes. So imagine in a stadium, you can't be, you know, if you look at the seating rows, if I add one inch more of con concrete on a 20,000 capacity, it changes my concrete yeah. cost will go, go up. So you took 31 months to build the stadium. Yes. How many months did you take to plan this? Maybe about 24 months because okay. we had the luxury. Um, some things don't happen at your pace. So I, we utilize that time better to sit down as a team. We had my entertainment team. We had my sports team, we had my marketing team, we had sound and audio consultants. I had the blessing of Star Sports who came in and did some At the broadcast planning. Itself, yes. So all of that was done from the beginning so that we were able to get every angle sorted out. So I'm sure this kind of a project and this scale of a project on a very global platform, I cannot say it basis of only Gujarat or India for that matter. It's on a global standards. Once upon a time, it was a plan and today it is a reality. So how did you select your team and how did you monitor the daily going ons at the location, at the venue? Good question. Um, this sector didn't have players in India. And uh, the only person who was actually aligned with this was our technology provider from UK. Paul Fletcher. Paul Fletcher. Paul Fletcher and Stadi Arena, which is their company, and Miller Homes, which is the architect, they've done more than 2 million seats worth of stadium design and execution. Fantastic. That's huge. 2 million That's seats huge. worth of That's huge. work. So we use that experience and then we got on the best in hospitality, the best in project management. And the advantage I have is I'm from the auto sector. Mm -hmm. we, we plan every rupee. Precision every, engineering. Every pesa, we do our material planning well in advance. Precision engineering. So the amount yes. of money we saved in procurement, the amount of time we saved in getting things in the supply chain properly is all the advantages we took from the auto sector. As far as the team, we had a project management consultant on the ground. We had a separate contractor. We had a separate quality team. And me as the guy who's doing the project, I was on the ground maybe three days every week. 
So when you started this project, you definitely had a capital expenditure on table. Yes. You had to cost save it or spend that much or go overboard by a certain percentage. So cost uh, calculation, budgeting and monitoring it is comfortable. What are your steps for matching it with revenue generation and how close are you to matching what you plan for in terms of revenues? My revenues are a challenge because Ahmedabad is a, is a very interesting market. Um, when we got into commerce at that time, I had a politically motivated PIL against my project. So I couldn't go and market it because I didn't want to be on the wrong side of the court. Though we knew there was nothing that's going to happen, you can't piss a judge off. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. So, so Especially we, in a democracy. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. So we went, we, we started it, but we were very low on making a noise. So has it delayed your revenue calculations by some a certain period of time? We are, we are behind maybe by a, uh, a year and a half maybe. I could have done it a lot faster. So I think a few things have slowed us down. But I think after getting, we are now the home of all the major leagues except IPL. Everything else is at the stadium. We are the host of all the entertainment. 75% of all the conferences and um, events, MICE events that happen in Gujarat happen at our venue. Fantastic. We are the preferred venue of all events by the government of Gujarat. Fantastic. So now people know us. So uh, like I know that in a theater, your least revenue is from the telecast of those movies. Correct. But your majority of the revenue comes from the shopping centers, the food courts and the food facilities around. Right. So what percentage of revenue do you build in, in the stadium other than the sporting activities, but which happened because of the sporting activities? See, sports does not make money. Yes. Very clearly. Yes. Sports is an aggregator. It brings the footfalls. It gets the footfalls. And how do you leverage those footfalls? Yeah, so you've got to sell them food. And Ahmedabad is a, Gujarat is a dry state. Absolutely. So people, people love eating. People love to get out and eat. People have two dinners in the night. They'll eat at 8, they'll eat at 11.30. So you've got to be able to cater to that taste. You've got to get the right kind of ambience out there. Um, maybe 15 to about... 18% of our revenue is from FNB and banqueting, you know, which is a very major part of... Balance, you also create events other than sporting activities at the uh, venue? Of course. Uh, we've done we've done an ARMAN concert at mm -hmm. a large scale. Mm -hmm. We've done stand-up comedy on a small scale. So, you know, we've done the whole bunch of events. And I think events is very important because it also gets you the non-sport... In India today, the people who don't like sport or don't watch sport or live sport are a lot more than the people who like live sport. So you've got to get them into the facility. And they are also a big target for us. So, so you've got to balance sport out. It can't just be sport. So when you have an infrastructure which has got an expenditure every moment and time is a perishable commodity, so your expense gets incurred, but your revenue depends on the opportunity. Yes. So how do you make sure that you are maximizing your revenue so that you can offset the expenses? How many days in a year should such a project be occupied to break even and make decent profits? Our target is to hit about 240, 260 days of utilization okay. per year. And okay. it has to be a heady mix um, of sport, non-sport activities. We have a club, we have club memberships, you know, they drive a lot of revenue for us. And finally, the members are very important because, you know, even if you have 10,000 families, that's 40,000 people. I'm a 20,000 seater stadium. Only they can buy all the tickets. So I have to create a fantastic uh, uh, environment over there, which is catered to them. And uh, we, we plan a full plethora of activities. It cannot just be sport. So you are also focusing on events. How much do you believe in collaboration and what kind of revenue can be brought in with the right collaborations? I think... Like a UFC happening in Ahmedabad. I think collaborations are the key. I don't think we can do everything on our own. Absolutely. And we shouldn't. Absolutely. There is a lot of innovating th thinking out there. Absolutely. From small events to large events. And I think it's important we welcome them. We tell them, please come, do your event here. I'll do an event for vice chancellors. I'll do an event for PTAs of schools. And I'll do it for big channels like yourself. You know, So it's important that we, we get everyone in there. Fantastic. Uh, friends, you would like to know this, that Udit has become the first more advantaged guy in this beautiful country of India with such a large population, which can definitely play sports and become one of the best sporting countries in the world. But we need infrastructure like what he has built in Gujarat, Transtadia. And he intends to replicate and multiply these kind of facilities across the country. I would like to ask you, Udit, how are you going to leverage the kind of experience that you have got because you have been there, you have done that, you have actually implemented and over-delivered what you promised 
to the government of Gujarat and to the people of Gujarat and the people of the country. So how do you plan to leverage this knowledge and create multiple opportunities for your organization? I think the, the sky is the limit really. You know, in a market like India, we are young. We are looking for new activities. I think sports is coming up in a big way. Entertainment still hasn't taken off because live entertainment doesn't have venues. What we are planning to do is, and what I am doing is, I am in touch with about six to eight state governments. Okay. We are talking for multiple city developments and we don't have to go the mega infra model in all the cities. Okay. You can cut them, you can make them larger and I have learned so much from here. I can possibly do this same project now at two-thirds the cost. Fantastic. In other locations because Fantastic. we've learned where we can save, save money. Save the money. So, and uh, there are a lot of entrepreneurs who are actually scared of working with the governments. So the idea of taking land from the government and developing a private project on it and being exposed to activities like a PIL which you have already faced in your uh, journey. What is your advice to entrepreneurs about working with government organizations and government owned assets? I think government is great at capex. And government is not the best at most efficient at OPEX, operating expenses. So one should work very closely with them. They are today the largest event organizers in the country. Absolutely. Unlimited right? budgets. They keep doing a lot of things. Absolutely. They, the tourism department, the industry department, I can keep going on. And therefore, to collaborate with them is important. They're also the biggest landlord in the country. Absolutely. Now, if you go to a private sector and try and take land from them, they'd rather build villas, they'd rather build houses, they'd rather build... Uh, commercial infrastructure. So I think it's important in my sector at least to collaborate with government. It also helps us build very long-term relationships with them because they will be coming here and doing events. It also helps in tax exemptions which is a great benefit. Uh, it saver. can help in many exemptions. Okay. It depends from state to state what budgets they have. They can give you a subsidy, they can give you power at concessional rates, they can... They Build can the overall infrastructure around the project and uh, facilities to reach it better. Yeah, absolutely. When we did this project, um, and uh, when we finished it, for example, the retail rentals which were there at X became 4X. Fantastic. The land value which was at X became 2.5X. So such projects actually not only develop sports and entertainment, they are actually urban placed projects, they develop city centers, they develop lifestyle, they develop communities. So even the government is interested that please come and help me. I know what I can do, but you know what you're doing the best. And there are so many defunct stadiums in India today. So friends, uh, apart from uh, Trans Stadia and the sporting activities, Udit is also involved in the business which his father has started and uh, which has got a great history to itself, Setco. And Udit spends uh, one-fourth or rather more than one-fourth of his time even at Setco. And I would like to understand what is the new that you added in Setco and if you can explain to the viewers what Setco is all about and what is the new that you added to the uh, enterprise other than what your dad has done. So I think Setco was a very well-oiled machine when I joined and my dad's built the business from scratch. It's a leading clutch manufacturing company. We're a tier one. We supply to all the truck manufacturers and tractor manufacturers in India. And it's a near monopoly business. It's a listed entity. So when I joined the business, I started as a trainee. I went through the ropes. I spent a lot of time in the market, in the transport nuggers, because that's where you change the clutch. Clutches. You meet the mechanics, you meet the garage owners, you understand their problems. So I spent a lot of time in r and I've spent a lot of time in uh, service of the business. And I think what I've brought to the business is a lot of process orientation. I believe I've been able to build in good HR practices, made it a, helped it grow because I think without good people, you can't grow any business or even plan any business. It's the same in Transtadia, it's the same in Setco. And I think one of the best learnings that I've had is to sit with my dad for him to give me that freedom also to build in that process. You know, not many entrepreneurs, first generation, like other people trampling in their areas. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. But for him to allow you to do that is a blessing in, its, in itself. And I got to work with so many people with so many years of experience. So you have got experiences of two enterprises. One is the one which is a family business. Yeah. The second one is the one that you built. Yeah. Uh, it is said that uh, your success depends on the quality of people you have. Correct. And the quality of people that you have, when their quality becomes extraordinarily better, it becomes difficult to retain them. So what has been your HR policy? How do you recruit? How do you train? How do you retrain? And how do you retain talent? When we are out there, first of all, we only recruit if we can't find a roadmap for an internal resource to grow. Okay. 
And I think it's very important and many organizations in the speed of growing sometimes compromise that time that is required for the management to spend time with other management to help them grow. And I think there's got to be a quid pro quo. I okay. think the, uh, the people who you work with also have to show that energy, that enthusiasm, that fire in their belly to want to actually take up more. In Setco, for example, we had the legacy team and then we had a lot of new team that was coming in. For us, it was important to also train them. We put them through all the best training programs and a lot of internal training. So not only did I get involved, but I got my, we got our board directors involved, we got our advisors involved in one day, half day, two hour, three hour training programs that are required. And, and I think one of the important things is that you spend a lot of money on training. You know, there's an important saying, there was a conversation between a CEO and a CFO. Mm -hmm. The CEO wanted to spend a large amount of money on training people and the CFO asked a question. What if the person leaves? But the CEO then turned around and said, but what if we don't train him and he stays? That's more dangerous. <laughs> That's more dangerous. So Absolutely. You've got to invest on training. You've got to invest on development of people. And uh, I think organizational building would take up about 70% of anyone's time. And if you don't give that time, you're, you're not doing justice to your people. Fantastic. So what type of a leader are you, Udit? I am a, a participative leader. If you ask me if uh, I have a team of people who come into the meeting. I like okay. to keep meetings short, mm -hmm. but I like to keep them with a small group. But I'd like to listen to people. I want to know what they have to bring to the table, mm -hmm. uh, how they can contribute, what their aspirations are, because we've recruited people for their intelligence and not to take instructions and to listen to a monologue. There has to be a dialogue. And that's my way of working. I take decisions, but I'd like people to really participate and feed me. I don't know everything. They know a lot more than I do. So like uh, Dhirubhai Ambani believed in hiring people smarter than him but under his control. <laughs> so you believe in the same philosophy, I guess. He is far smarter and look what he's <laughs> built including this place. So I mean, there is... Uh, How do you no monitor comparison. the productivity of your team? We have very clear KRAs and KPIs that we have. The, these are very common words used but we, we work very closely with our team members to set goals. Is there anything unique in your review mechanism? Uh, it's not unique but it's one thing that we are very clear about that we don't rate people on how they are to me or how they look or how they come across. It's more on what, what's performed and I think that's important. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, business is a very interesting journey and it's all about decision making. Every moment of breathing life, you have to keep taking decisions. Some decisions which impact you positively, some decisions which might slow you down in your uh, goal sets and your journey. So how good are you at decision making and what precautions do you take before you take a decision? I think the philosophy I work with is to not take a decision is the worst decision. I think you've got to come to Absolutely. a conclusion quickly. Um, of course, you have to spend a lot of time data mining. You've got to ask a lot of questions. You've got to look at things from different perspectives. Do you calculate consequences of a decision in advance? I think you have to. But you don't get it right each time. I mean, you'll get half of them wrong. You also. believe in course correcting? Yes, very much so. Do you There's put it a, to a sounding board? We have a very clear mandate in the company. If we are going to do a new project, it, unless it goes through four filters of review, we won't go ahead. So there are different people who come in at different review levels and it has to cut through all those four layers before it actually has a go ahead. Fantastic. So friends, India is developing as a country, fast developing as a country, thanks to very successful, focused and confident entrepreneurs like Udit whom you have just heard and uh, before we could conclude the session, I would like to ask you Odit, what is entrepreneurship according to you? Entrepreneurship is to, uh, to have a mind which is open to learning new things. Okay. I think as an entrepreneur, you may have an idea, but I can tell you from day one, when you go on to planning to the day 10, when you've gone into commerce, that idea has changed. The core idea may be the same, but the things that you thought will make it get there, they all change. So you, as an entrepreneur, you have to be able to cost correct, learn and let other people come into your uh, business and add value and add things which you are not able to foresee. Fantastic. What's your learning curve? How do I answer that? What's my <laughs> learning curve? I, I read a lot and, uh, and I expect people around me to read a lot. And I think learning, learning is an everyday process. The faster you can take it up, the better it is for you, I think. That's, that's the most important thing. And for the world to know, what's your next five years goal? I would like to see at least a couple of more facilities up and running in India, in different parts of the country. I'd want to have uh, large format entertainment come into India. 
I'd love to see the Fit India campaign, which I'm a committee member of with the government of India, become a huge success because I think India's talent funnel is huge. I think we need to make the funnel larger. And, and channelize it. And the Fit India movement, which the PM launched about a couple of weeks ago, is, is all about that. Bring, Fantastic. So, as Trans Stadia, we want to build city centers, but we want to also build the backbone of sport. Fantastic. So that was Udit said for you. Thank you, Udit. Thank that you very much. That was an awesome, much. inspiring conversation. I'm sure a lot of people will be inspired. The size of your goal doesn't matter. If you're confident and if you're knowledgeable about what you want to do, the world is there to provide you with the resources. I wish you all the best, Udit. Thank you so and, much. And uh, keep being inspired. Thank you. St. Angelo's VNCT Ventures is one of the largest villa developers in India. Brings to you the White Villas Kasara, located in Kasara, which is declared as no chemical zone and green zone. 3 BHK Wonderful Villa comes with a power backup facility and RO water purification facility enabling clean water. Private garden and parking facility are also provided and comes with a swimming pool, cricket pitch and futsal pitch along with large walking area. Designer Villas comes with land ownership, 360 degree lush green view, very near from Mumbai and Thane, 1.2 kilometers away from Kisara local railway station, adjoining to Mumbai Nasik Highway, assured rentals with zero maintenance, high capital appreciation expected in coming years on this road, 20 feet double height living room, world class materials with best amenities. The work of the White Villas Kasara is in full swing and position with all amenities is expected by 2020. So grab the opportunity and do your villa booking today. Call us on 9011-223344 or visit us on www.savvglobal.com.